Dear friends, it is good to have you again. Paul in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says, Dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and soul, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. The modern reader may find the dietary restrictions in the book of Leviticus quite strange or even meaningless. Why did God require a set of dietary restrictions for His people to be followed? One thing can be said is that their God was holy and they are to imitate His holiness in every aspect of their life. The verse that I read out in the beginning doesn't apply to any physical contamination born out of food, but it does communicate to us that God's holiness should comprise or encompass the whole of a believer's life. The modern reader may find dietary restrictions in the book of Leviticus quite strange or even meaningless. Why did God require a set of dietary restrictions for His people to be followed? One thing can be said is that God was holy and they are to imitate His holiness in every aspect of their life. The verse that I read out in the beginning doesn't apply to any physical contamination born out of food but it does communicate to us that God's holiness should comprise or encompass the whole of a believer's life. God's holiness was an attainable reality even back in the Old Testament, which dealt with every aspect of people's daily life. He is Lord of your entire life. You cannot compartmentalize into secular and spiritual and tell God that, Lord, you be the Lord of this and not that. He was not to be served only at special times and special places designated or labeled as worship. For a group of people who were heading to an alien hostile culture, it was wise to have as many regulations as possible. It was meant to preserve and protect them from associating with their pagan neighbors. They are to follow these laws of their own free will. But we see restrictions always protecting them from being impure. We are not told of the rational of why some animals and not others. Scholars have many varied reasons on this, but they too have not come to a consensus. However, one thing is certain, God knows. And all Israel was required to do was obey the infinite wisdom of God. I warmly welcome you again, even as we continue to dig the Word of God in detail. Well, greetings, dear friend. This is Through the Bible. For the believer, there are some spiritual applications. We're talking about animals and how they chew the cut, how they chew the cut and how uh, we can draw some principles from this aspect of chewing the cut. We've already shown that there is no merit in following a ritual regarding meat. But it is interesting to note that to meditate now is a figurative expression of a cow chewing the cud. Psalm 1 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Meditating is a valid application for the chewing of the cud, for the spiritual benefit of believers. Likewise, the parting of the hoof speaks of the walk of the believer in separation. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, Ephesians 4.1, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us. See then that ye walk circumspectly, or carefully, not as fools, but as wise, Ephesians 5, 2 and verse 15. The relationship between the study of the word of God and the walk of the believer is intimately tied together. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learnt and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learnt them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. James 1.22 says, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. That is James 1.22. My friend, the walk of the believer is tied up with the word of God. If you are going through this world, you will have to chew the cud. That is the word of God. And you will need to have that separated walk that only the word can produce. 
The Bible studying believer who puts into practice the teaching of the Word of God identifies himself as a child of God by his work and by his walk. Friend, what kind of tracks are you making? I remember the story of a man years ago when someone tried to hand him a tract. He asked what it was and and was told that it was a tract, T-R-A-C-T. He handed it back and said he couldn't read it. He said, I'll just watch your tracks. That is T-R-A-C-K-S. Leviticus 11, 4-8 Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the corny, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof, and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. Of their flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch. They are unclean to you. This is an extended list of animals which are unclean. Evidently, there must have been some question about these animals. Only vegetable-eating animals chew the cud. This eliminated the carnivorous animals. God warned about eating a camel. The reaction would be, who would want to? Don't you think this adds a note of humor to the words of our Lord when he accused the Pharisees of straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel? The camel wasn't only lumpy, he was unclean. A corny is something like a rabbit and lives in rocky places. This corresponds to our rabbit. It's quite interesting to me that today there are those who emphasize that one should not eat pork, but I have never heard them mention that one should not eat rabbit. The swine divides the hoof but does not chew the cud. The pig seems to be constantly eating but does not chew the cud. It is interesting to note that pork is still a difficult meat to digest. Swine are unclean animals. They are unclean in their eating habits. The Israelite was even forbidden to have contact with dead carcasses of these unclean animals. The spiritual implications of these are unavoidable. Clean and unclean creatures. Leviticus 11, 9-12 These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters, whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers. Them shall ye eat. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters, and of any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. They shall be even an abomination unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, but ye shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. There is a sharp line drawn here as well as among animals. The clean fish must be characterized by two visible marks, fins and scales, to be clean. This rule applied to both fresh and saltwater fish. Crawling creatures in the water were forbidden, which would eliminate a great segment of the creatures of the waters. No examples are given, probably because the distinction is very clear-cut. Israel depended on the supply of fish from the Mediterranean Sea, the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. Fish played a prominent part in the diet of the nation. One of the gates of Jerusalem was called the Fish Gate. This is where the fish from the Mediterranean were brought in, and it is interesting that this was a problem in the times of Nehemiah. The fishermen would bring in their fish on the Sabbath day, Nehemiah 13 verses 16 to 22. The important role of fishing in the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is well known to the student of the New Testament. The first disciples, our Lord, called were fishermen. They were told that they were to become fishers of men. Jesus told the parable that the kingdom of heaven is like a net which caught good fish and bad fish. Matthew thirteen forty seven to 50 What was the method of determining the good from the bad fish? It is not whether the fish were large or small, but would be according to the Levitical law. A fish that has both fins and scales is clean or good. But how is this like the judgment 
of the wicked from among the just. Well, the believer is the one who is propelled by the Holy Spirit and who is clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Those are the two identifying marks. Those are the fins and scales, if you please. Clean and unclean flying creatures in the air. Now that would be from verses 13 to 19 here in chapter 11. And these are they which ye shall have in abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten, they are an abomination, the eagle and the osphrage and the osprey, and the vulture and the kite after his kind, every raven after his kind, and the owl and the night hawk and the cuckoo, and the hawk after his kind, and the little owl and the cormorant, and the great owl, and the swan and the pelican, and the gear eel, and the stalk the heron after her kind, and the lapwing and the bat. On the birds there are no visible markers like there are on the fish and the animals, but they seem to have in common that they are all unclean feeders. For the most part they feed on dead carcasses of animals, fish and other fowl. The list of unclean birds of Palestine is given. This is another point that reveals that the Mosaic system was intended for the nation of Israel and also for the particular land of Palestine. Some of these birds sound strange to us. They fall into the family of the eagles and the hawks, the vultures and the ravens, the owls and the cormorants, and the swans and the pelicans. They don't even sound appetizing. They are the dirty birdies because of their feeding habits. Now remember, some people eat some of these birds today. I can't say I would like any of them, but whether we eat them or don't eat them makes no difference. Meat will not commend us to God. The point is that it was teaching Israel to make a distinction. They had to make a decision about what was clean and unclean. The lesson for us today is that we must make decisions about our conduct and our profession. We have to make the decision about whether to accept the Lord Jesus Christ or not, whether to study the Word of God or not, whether to walk in a way pleasing to God or not. That is the application for us today. This section draws some light on the experience of Elijah. He was fed by the ravens. Now, they were dirty words. Elijah did not eat the ravens, but they fed him. This was a humbling experience for this man of God who obeyed God in every detail. Now, clean and unclean creeping creatures. Now, these are the animals on the ground. All fowls that creep going upon all four shall be an abomination unto you. Yet these may ye eat of every flying creeping thing that goeth upon all four which have legs above their feet, to leap withal upon the earth. Even those of them ye may eat, the locust after his kind, the bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind. But all other flying creeping things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. Now people, you can leave all of these <laughs> of my menu. However, we must note that some of them are clean. These were apparently four species of locusts. The locust was the regular species. The bald locust had a protuberance. The beetle was a locust with a protuberance and a tail. The grasshopper was a locust with a tail but without a protuberance. So they were permitted to eat these four kinds of locusts. But friend, if you're having me over for dinner, let's have something else, please. Although they don't appeal to me, there is nothing religiously or ceremonially unclean about them. Remember John the Baptist? He had a scriptural diet when he ate locusts and wild honey. Now here it's talking about the next section, verses 24 to 28. We're going to talk about the contact with carcasses of unclean animals. And for these ye shall be unclean. Whosoever toucheth the carcass of them shall be unclean until the even. And whosoever beareth aught of the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. The carcasses of every beast which divideth the hoof and is not cloven-footed, nor cheweth the cud, are unclean unto you. Everyone that toucheth them shall be unclean. 
and whatsoever goeth upon his paws among all manner of beasts that go on all four, these are unclean unto you. Whoso toucheth their carcass shall be unclean until the even, and he that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until even. They are unclean unto you. Not only was Israel forbidden to eat unclean animals, but also they were forbidden to touch the carcass of an unclean animal. Contamination by contact is the principle here. This was a great principle of life that was restated in the days of the return of Israel after the captivity. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touches any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. This is Haggai chapter 2 verses 11 to 13. There is a very important principle set before us here. Cleanness or holiness is not transferred by contact. On the contrary, dirt, sin and unholiness are transferred by contact. In other words, it is impossible to bring holiness out of the unholy. But the unclean can affect the clean. An unrighteous man cannot produce righteous works, which are acceptable to God. You cannot bring righteousness out of unrighteousness. This principle operates as a law in every sphere of life, in all strata of society. A liter of dirty water is not made clean by adding five liters of clean water. On the other hand, one drop of dirty water will contaminate the clean water. A boy with measles is never cured by contact with a boy who is well, but the well boy may very well catch the measles from the sick boy. A believer, a person who claims to follow Christ, cannot mingle with the world and play with sin without becoming contaminated. Where do we get the idea that a believer can dabble with drugs and drinking? And, and all the wild parties that are around. Some claim that the way to reach the lost is to meet them on their level. Well, do they reach the lost that way? No, they are contaminated and take part in those sins themselves. The New Testament is clear on this. Jude 23 says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. It is a terrible mistake to mix and mingle with sin. We are to beware of all contamination. An Israelite was reminded of this great principle when he walked along the road and saw a dead dog or a dead bear. He was forbidden to carry the carcass of any part of it. He was not to take a bone or the skin of any use. If he inadvertently touched the carcass of an unclean animal, he was to wash his garments and remain unclean until the end of the day. Now these are great spiritual lessons for us. The believer is sanctified by the redemption of Christ and is clothed with his garments of righteousness. But we walk through the world where we can become contaminated. We still have the old nature. Not until we lay down this body in death will we be completely and totally sanctified and removed from the very presence of sin. Verses 29 to 31 of Leviticus 11. These also shall be unclean unto you. Among the creeping things that creep upon the earth, the weasel and the mouse and the tortoise after his kind, and the ferret and the chameleon and the lizard and the snail and the mole, these are unclean to you among all that creep. Whosoever doth touch them when they be dead shall be unclean until the even. These are creatures that live on the ground or under the ground. They must have been rather commonplace, but they were to be avoided by the Israelite. 
The carcass of a mole could contaminate him as much as the carcass of an elephant. So he was constantly reminded that he lived in a world of fallen creatures and that little sins are as heinous in God's sight as big sins. The moat and the beam are alike to God. Little sins are also sin and must be avoided. Now this is verses 32 to 36. And upon whatsoever any of them, when they are dead, doth fall, it shall be unclean. Whether it be any vessel of wood or raiment or skin or sack, whatsoever vessel it be, wherein any work is done, it must be put into water, and it shall be unclean until the even, so it shall be cleansed. And every earthen vessel wherein to any of them falleth, whatsoever is in it shall be unclean, and ye shall break it. Of all meat which may be eaten, that on which such water cometh shall be unclean, and all drink that may be drunk in every such vessel shall be unclean. And everything whereupon any part of their carcass falleth shall be unclean, whether it be oven or ranges for pots, they shall be broken down, for they are unclean, and shall be unclean unto you. Nevertheless, a fountain or pit, wherein there is plenty of water, shall be clean, but that which toucheth their carcass shall be unclean. Now we go into the kitchen. It must have been a commonplace experience for some rodent to get into the kitchen of that day and fall into one of the vessels and die. Any earthen vessel had to be broken and the water or grain or whatever was in it had to be thrown. A bronze vessel had to be cleaned after that. It had to be scored clean. You see, God taught his people cleanliness in the preparation of food, and he was teaching them a lesson in holiness. Every vessel was holy to God, and it was all to remain clean. In the Mosaic system, cleanliness was next to godliness, and this applied to even the smallest detail in domestic matters. God guarded his people against contamination and pollution. If the dead carcass fell into a fountain or a lake, the water was not contaminated. It was too big and too fresh. Isn't it wonderful that the Lord Jesus Christ is the fountain of living water? He is not contaminated by contact with the sinner or the sick, the leper or the woman, with an issue of blood. Jesus said in John 4 verse 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Also in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Dear friend, I hope you've learned some important lessons from our study today. Let me invite you to take a look at the life of Lot. In Genesis, we read that he looked up to the land of Sodom and find it appealing and parted company with his uncle Abraham. He did not have all these laws to regulate, but he had witnessed his uncle Abraham's life and how the one and only true living God was leading him to a great blessing of which he too could have been a part of. Instead, we see him going and settling in the land of wicked sinners, as we read in Genesis 13, based on his own choice. Later, when the city was going to be destroyed for blatant wickedness, we see angels arriving to warn Lot and his family. The man of Sodom wanted to commit homosexuality with the visitors, and Lot tries to prevent it by even offering his daughters. They even condemned him, saying, as a stranger among them, he had no right to judge them. He was earlier spotted sitting at the city gates. In 2 Samuel, we see David too at the city gate. So maybe Lord was an official of some sort, but we see he has no power to prevent the wickedness of the people. He lived amid impurity and did not care for what wickedness transpired around him because all he had cared for was the fertile land. He even put his family in danger, as we see in his offer of his daughters to those men. Later, we see daughters commit incest with their father, indicating to us 
Having lived among sinners, they too had the same mindset as the Sodomites. My dear brothers and sisters, take care not to conform to the pattern of this world. Guard yourselves against the filth that so much surrounds you. May God help us all. God bless you. Thank you.